brought to you from Melbourne, Australia. This is the Badminton Podcast, a community for badminton players by badminton players, where we talk badminton, celebrate local heroes, interview players from all walks of life, and push you to grow as a player and a person. Introducing your hosts, Jeff and Henry. Welcome to the Badminton Podcast. I'm Jeff. And I'm Henry. And we're really happy that you've joined us again today for our show because we're here because we love badminton and we want to build a community where we talk to badminton players, fans, officials, and everyone surrounding badminton so that we can learn from them, we can speak from experience, and we can hear their stories because a lot of you have awesome stories to tell. So thanks so much for joining us. Today, we have a really special guest. And to the badminton world, I'm sure a lot of people know him. His name is Raphael Sashitat. We came there and we went there and, and we put the badminton post and the nets and then suddenly all the kids came and started playing with us and the parents were looking at them and they told us that it was the first time they see them smile after the earthquake, after the disaster, which was weeks before. Of course, you know, it's, it's heartbreaking and, and you feel like it's not fair, but that's life and, and we need to face it and continue for all the others who succeed. Badminton had a, a huge impact uh, on my life. I think the traveling has made the, the biggest impact because when you travel, your eyes are open, uh, your mind is more open and then you realize how lucky you are because I am able to see the world through different concepts, different ways of thinking and, and I think that's that's very interesting and I'm really grateful for that. Raphael Sashitat. Did I say that right? Yes, correct. Great. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Thanks for being on, Raphael. My pleasure. Just a bit about Raphael. He was a former leisure player in France. And after a few years, when he became a journalist, he started working as a freelancer for different magazines, firstly in human rights and then in badminton. He first worked for the International Badminton Federation, which is now called Badminton World Federation or BWF. And he started covering the world tour as a reporter. And then slowly he got into photography. Then he created the official photo agency Badminton Photo, which I know probably everyone's aware of. And he started that in 2004. And he's also had a channel of websites dedicated to badminton information and journalism, such as Bad Zine, which I'm also very familiar with. He was the photo manager at the Commonwealth Games in 2014 and the Olympic Games in 2012 in London. In 2009, together with really good friends and some of the best badminton players in the world, he started Solabad, Badminton Without Borders. Raphael, thanks again for coming on. Well, thank you for having me. So, Raphael, it's uh, quite an impressive CV that Jeff just read out for you and I'm kind of lost as to where we should begin. But I think we should start with badminton and I'd just like to ask firstly, how did you get involved? Um, well, first I started playing quite late uh, compared to many of my friends on the tour. Um, and uh, of course, I've always played as a leisure player, but I started when I was 21 uh, and it was a uh, mostly luck that brought me to badminton. I was, uh, I was actually going to register for tennis at my university in Paris, but uh, the sessions were all full. And that very same day uh, that I went, there was a badminton session. So, um, you know, I had never seen it play in a hall. I thought it was only a backyard sport, like like many people in the world. So, you know, I tried my luck. I tried it for a few minutes and, and I fell in love with the sport right away. That was just um, an amazing sport. And after you, you kept playing socially, did you? Or did you, how, how many years did you play for? Well, I, I played from uh, when I was 21 almost until now. I had to stop because of uh, back problems, but I, I played almost 20 years, of course, uh, as a leisure level. But uh, I know what it takes to be a, a good player. <laughs> That's what I can tell. Absolutely. You've been around for a long time and you do know a lot of the top players. And when you were getting into badminton itself, when you were playing leisurely, what about the sport? made you decide that you wanted to do journalism in badminton and then photography and now bad zine and solo bad what about the sport do you love well i loved it because uh, first of all it's uh, it's a fun game it's a lot of fun to play and uh, we can enjoy it 
you know, as a single player, as a mixed double player, as a, a doubles player. And I also had a lot of fun because being from a tennis background, I could make a lot of progress very easily at the beginning. So I was getting quite good. So that motivated me. But also, you know, I had so many passions at the same time as I was a reporter and I liked photography and I thought it would be uh, nice to put together all my passion. So, you know, being a reporter, I thought, why couldn't I report on badminton? Because I like to play and I know more and more about the sport. So that's that's how I, you know, involved all of my passion and later on, of course, uh, charity work. It sounds like you're juggling quite a lot of things at the same time there, Raphael. I mean, how did you decide to put all those things together into firstly Badzine and, and then Solabad? Well, it made sense for me to um, to do something with badminton related to my work. As a reporter, you know, I knew I could do something new and there was uh, very little channels of information about badminton at the time. So we started Badzine in France where even the Federation didn't have a proper online page it was the very beginning of uh, of the internet i sound very old when i say this but it's true that there was not so many pages online and uh, so we we were at the very beginning of that so i thought why not we we had the opportunity to report on on the sport because i was touring uh, the world and it was nice for me to be able to uh, uh, to talk to the players it was just a question of opportunity mainly and when you were doing journalism and you were involved in going to the tournaments and the circuit, did you see that there was a gap for photography as well? Is that why you got into that? Yes, definitely. Um, my first uh, report, it was in uh, 1999 in the US Open. And when I went there, there was no press, no written press and no photographer. So, And it was one of the you know, the big tournaments in the world. So I figured that there would be something there for me to uh, go into as a reporter, because that was my education, but also as a leisure photographer at first, it was obvious that there was some room for, for me to, uh, to get involved at uh, you know, a higher pace and, and something bigger than I did before. Yeah, and how does badminton photo relate now? So what is badminton photo doing now in terms of international badminton? Um, well, we follow basically the whole tour, the, the biggest tournaments, uh, all the Super 500 and 750 and 1000 and all the majors, um, also the World Junior Championships. And so it's a lot of tournaments to cover. And we are still uh, the uh, official agency for the BWF, which is uh, it's great because we are able to go to all these places and, and you know, share our work and our passion through our photography. And Raphael, as part of the photography, are you still what, like the main photographer there or do you have a couple of other photographers working for you at the moment? Now there are more and more photographers because there are more and more tournaments to cover. And it's, uh, it's a very tough job to follow the tour and deal with the jet lag and, and everything. Like all the players, and I'm sure you are very much aware of this, uh, so we had to split uh, between uh, three and four photographers uh, so now, basically, we are four major photographers and we also use freelancers from time to time for uh, smaller events or for photographers that we feel have a, a spe special eye and uh, we want them to be part of the team. So it's a, it's a growing team at the moment. Yeah, great. And with those photos, does, does that sort of follow on and to, and into your bad zine work as well? Do you use those photos on the articles that you write in bad zine? Yes, of course. Um, the photos go basically everywhere from federations to, uh, of course, the BWF. Now they have a, a lot of uh, social media and they're doing great work with it. Uh, but also we work with uh, the players, the uh, media, sponsors. You know, we try to, uh, to help everyone promote the sport through our photography. It really seems like your, your life has revolved around the sport, Raphael. Is there something about the sport from when you first begun that, that's just really keeping you in it and, and involved with the sport? Is there something that you really love about it? Well, when you get involved so early into a community, you feel like you're part of it. You know, when I started, um, I was 25, 26, and uh, interviewing players who were 19, 20, all the legends were starting to, you know, arise. And I felt like because I was the only one uh, traveling with them, basically, uh, that I was part of the tour. I was part of their big family. So 
I created a lot of uh, links and I had a lot of uh, great relationships with uh, a lot of uh, players, umpires, officials that I would follow, you know, from different places around the world that that made me feel like I was part of a new family. So that helped, of course, me being involved for so long because I still see many friends now. Some of them are coaches, but I still feel, you know, this is also my family and, and that helped me going for all these years. But also the other thing that helped me was, uh, was sort of bad that we'll probably talk about later. And the fact that I could put my charity work into my passion and into that world that I knew so well, that really gave me a lot of uh, motivation. Yeah. And you've come a long way. You've started off just starting with your journalism and then photography and then Commonwealth Games and Olympic Games as well. And now the world tour. So I do know that there are a lot of photos from badminton photo that I see on social media, BWF, and they're fantastic. So Raphael, first of all, congratulations on what change and what contribution you've actually made to the sport. Cause I definitely know that it's a huge one and you, you are making the sport better. Well, thank you so much. And it's been a pleasure doing that. Uh, and, and it's a good reward to see all these images going everywhere because it's, uh, it's tough work. Maybe people don't realize what a difficult work is to be a photographer generally, but a sports photographer and a badminton photographer is, uh, you know, it's a, a low light condition. It's a very, very long days, but it's very rewarding to be able to uh, share you know, what we live and to be so close to the court and to share all these stories, the good ones and the bad ones. And, and it's great to see that it has an impact through the photography and through the stories mm. that I could write. That's great. And with the, with all the players that you've interacted with since 1999 or when you started until now, and you're seeing all of the top players grow up, evolve, develop, who would you say you had the best friendships and interactions with in the sport, who are the big names and who are the not so big names, but you've really developed that strong bond with? Uh, it's difficult to say because in 20 years time, of course, you build a lot of a uh, relationship with, uh, with players. I think the people I know from the longer time, maybe are the ones that have the, the strongest bonds. And, um, I would say at the time I was very, very close to Tofik. I don't see him so much uh, now because of course he's in Indonesian now not traveling so much. Uh, Peter Gede also has been a, a great friend of mine, and uh, and there are many many players that I've uh, created very strong bonds with um, French players, but also you know even players like Yong Yakyong from China. She's become a very good friend of mine, and uh, we often chat online. And, and even though we use a uh, translation devices <laughs> from time to time, but her English is quite good, and we 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 do interact uh, quite a lot. So. Um, and with officials, umpires, there's always, you know, uh, things to remember together. So it's, uh, like I said, the badminton community is my family. So it's, uh, it's always great to, to see them from time to time. So with your family, is, are there any particular interesting facts or funny stories that you can share with us and the audience? Uh, sure, uh, there are many, but uh, one I like to tell is uh, how I was the first, the first foreign reporter, or maybe the first reporter at all, to interview Linden when he was uh, very, very young. He was, uh, I think, sixteen or seventeen at the World Juniors in in two thousand uh, in Guangzhou. He was he was young and very shy, and uh, and I really saw something into him. Uh, and even though he lost that time, he lost in the semi final, I think, to Bao Chong Lai, but. Uh, I nicknamed him Super Dan in my article for the, the IBF, the BWF. And uh, even though he had lost, and, and that name stayed on and it was used everywhere. And I thought that was funny uh, to, uh, to see that nickname I had given him, um, you know, become like his official nickname. And uh, a funny story with, uh, with Linda and also a, a few years later, uh, one of my journalist friends, uh, invited me over for a dinner in a restaurant in Guangzhou after an event. And, and she asked me if she could bring along a couple of friends. And of course, I said yes, you know, being uh, happy to meet new people. And uh, it turned out that her friends were Linden and Jie Jing Fang. So that was, uh, it was quite funny. We ended up having dinner and going to the movies together. And I had never imagined that I would spend a, an evening with uh, these two legends uh, just because they were friends of my colleague. Just to get a bit more background information on that, on that, I suppose that date that you went on. Uh, what what time frame were we talking about? Is this when Lin Dan was at his peak? 
Yes, he was very, very famous. And when he entered the restaurant, he, he was wearing his cap and, uh, you know, obviously trying to avoid people. You know, I felt when I saw him enter the restaurant, I felt something was happening, but I didn't know why because I wasn't expecting him and Xi Jinping to come. And, and uh, his girlfriend at the time and wife, now she's from Guangzhou, so she's very famous there. So, of course, people looked at them and then looked at us, that table of four, and like, uh, you know, they didn't really want to come and interact because they felt like they were with friends. But of course, everybody was staring at us. So <laughs> that was uh, that was quite funny. Yeah, it's really quite strange to think about it because being in Australia and badminton in, uh, badminton players in Australia, it's, it's hard to believe that a, a top player can become so famous like they have over in China. Oh, you'd be surprised when, of course, Linda in China, but it's also true with the with the Taufik in Indonesia or big stars now. They they are um, legends. I mean, people would queue up for hours just to get an autograph, and uh, and they are known everywhere, wherever they go. Uh, Li Chongwei is the same in Malaysia, and that, there's also another story about Taufik that relates to this. It's um, I, I was quite close to him around, you know, when he was Olympic champion. He once invited me over to a, to go to a nightclub in Jakarta with his friends. So when we arrived there, I was driving in his car, and uh, they basically cleared the whole story for us. And he he was he was just a, a legend, you know. You should see the faces on the doorman and the manager, and uh, it was like uh, you know heaven when he came down. And uh, so they, they cleared the the story, and then uh, we could just have the whole nightclub for us for uh, for a few hours, and then. Uh, a few weeks later, I wanted to return the flavor, and I took Tofik to a nightclub in Denmark. He was uh, competing in the Copenhagen Masters. And then when we reached the, the nightclub, the doorman just wouldn't let us in. And, you know, it was so st- striking what a difference it, it was between his home in Indonesia when he was, a, you know, a god, a living god, and, and in Denmark when he was a nobody. And it was just uh, two weeks' time, but it's just a different space, different place. And, and that shows what kind of different treatment you get when you're famous and when you're not. It's crazy. Yeah, it's really interesting, isn't it, to see the, the differences between yeah, recognition for the sport. Although badminton is quite big in Denmark as well, but potentially, yeah, just not as big as in Indonesia where everyone knows him. So I'm sure that I would have tried to clear the club if I saw Tolfik, but... <laughs> <laughs> He didn't understand why we couldn't go in. You know, he was uh, questioning me. He was uh, saying, why can't we go in? And then after I told the doorman that uh, uh, my friend was the Olympic champion, then he let us in. But (laughs) there was one point where I thought we just wouldn't get into the nightclub. And Raphael, just based on all these really cool stories and where you started and where you've been and where you are right now, and we're going to get into Solibad because I think that's really what we want to talk about today. I just wanted to ask the question that I usually do ask people and that's how do you feel badminton has impacted in your life and what's it taught you? Like, Where would you be without badminton right now? Do you ever think about that? Um, I try not to because I don't want to have any regrets or anything, but of course badminton had a, a huge impact uh, on my life because uh, I've been doing a lot of things around the sport for the past 20 years. And uh, of course, the I think the traveling is what, has made the, the biggest impact because when you travel, your eyes are are open, uh, your mind is more open, and then you realize how lucky you are. Even though we spend a lot of time in the hotels and planes and uh, badminton halls, I always try to uh, interact with the fans or interact with the you know local communities and spend an extra day on the spot so uh, I can see what's actually happening there. And he taught me many, many things about life and about differences and, and tolerance. So. Of course, the sport itself and and, uh, the interaction with the people, the players, uh, the officials have made me a different person because I am able to see the world through different concepts, different ways of thinking. And and I think that's that's very interesting and I'm really grateful for that. Yeah, and I see that you're grateful because you're contributing so much as well, which is what we're going to get into now, which is Solabab, Badminton Without Borders. Raphael, can you tell me, what what it is and how did you actually start? Uh, well, Solibad stands for uh, Solidarity and Badminton. Uh, and of course, Badminton Without Borders relates to uh, the Doctors Without Borders. Uh, what we do is uh, is it charity work. It's, it's not development. And we leave that to people who know how to do that. But 
we, we do try with the help of, uh, of top players and leisure players and clubs and federations and anyone who wants to help to gather some money. And then we help fund some uh, programs for children. That's, that's what we've been doing for 10 years. And, um, and you know, it's, uh, it's great fun. It's a lot of work, but uh, it's very, very rewarding. Can you remember your very first project, Raphael? Uh, yes, um, the first one was uh, in Haiti. Um, I don't know if you remember, but in 2010, there was a, a major earthquake. We thought that uh, maybe we could try to help, and uh, we decided to bring some rackets, some shuttlecocks, and uh, a couple of friends of mine were badminton coaches, and we decided, let's go and see what we can do to uh, maybe make a change. And of course, when when I told all my friends that I was going to Haiti with the badminton rackets, they laughed at me and they said, you know, there's no way you're going to make a difference or change anything for these people because they don't need to play. They need food, mm. they need um, lodging, accommodation. Uh, but then, nevertheless, we tried our luck and, and we went on that plane uh, together with uh, these couple of friends and then we reached uh, uh, Haiti. And um, and it was quite striking because I remember very well it was this huge camp with uh, white tents and the families were all gathered in, in the tents and they had nothing to do. They had nothing. You know, it was only the help of the uh, UNICEF and, uh, and United Nations. But they had the essential, they had enough food and they had a you know so-called roof over their heads, but they didn't have anything to do. So we, we came there and we went there and, and we put the badminton post and the nets and then suddenly all the kids came and started playing with us and the, the parents were looking at them and they told us that it was the first time they see them smile after the earthquake, after the disaster, which was weeks before. And I realized that, you know, with rackets, with, a, you know, some fun, we could make a difference. And then we went there you know, a few days and then every day was the same thing. More and more kids would come and play and, and it was like a ritual and it, it was uh, amazing to see the smile on the, the kids' faces. So it taught me a lesson and, and I realized there that you don't, you don't need a lot of means or you don't need money, but if you have a, a little bit of time, a little bit of attention and you can actually make a difference. That's really interesting, Raphael, because that kind of crossed my mind as well because I love badminton, I love to play, but when the bigger picture comes into play where you're looking at housing, food, where do I live, where's my family going to go, what bad, what role does badminton actually have? But then when you talked about them just sitting and not having anything to do and the kids having fun, I think that's, that's really, really special. So how long were you actually there helping the kids and doing that for? We were there for three weeks. Um, first, the, the first days we were on the camps and, and doing this uh, interaction with the local kids. And then uh, we trained local coaches. Actually, it was PE teachers in Haiti. And of course, there, there was no badminton at all there. But uh, we thought that it could be a good way to uh, start, you know, to uh, start a, uh, a sparkle there to bring badminton. And we had brought a lot of rackets. so. Uh, basically every day with uh, Kavi Merabi also, uh, who was there, and an uh, Iranian player uh, who was in the Olympics, also a very good friend of mine. And uh, we started coaching the PE teachers. Some of them had never even seen badminton in their lives. And, but because everything was destroyed, they thought that it was a good way to start something new. And, and they all picked up their rackets. And for three weeks, every morning, we would go outside and we would explain to them the basic uh, uh, strokes, uh, how to hold the racket and everything. And then they could go back to their own classes and teach the kids. So this is how we started a little something in Haiti. And uh, we handed over the program to the uh, uh, Haiti Badminton Federation, which was built later on. And, and now they have a, you know, a huge uh, a number of, uh, of kids playing. Uh, it's in the schools and so um, it's it's very rewarding to see that it's it all started with just this you know three weeks at the time. And how did you get? How did you make contact with them to go there? Like, did you did you have a contact that you could call to say, hey, we're coming, or did you just go, or how did you organize it? No, no, we we of course we organized before. Uh, we had uh, contacts uh, through the UNICEF. 
uh, who were making sports programs. And of course, when they realized that uh, badminton was very easy to organize because it was, a, uh, you know, you could play anywhere. It's not so windy in Haiti, so it's it's good to, you know, to, uh, to play outside. Uh, but also the fact that it involved both boys and girls. They were very interested in the fact that we could play a mixed, uh, mixed sport. So they were very uh, happy to have us there. And it was through a, a program that we went. So I know that you've explained about the meaning of Solabad and the actual word meaning of it, solidarity in badminton. What about the logo? So it's like a rainbow logo. What's the story behind that? Well, we wanted to uh, to give an idea of uh, something joyful because, first of all, our, our programs are kids' programs. And, you know, in school, you learn how to write with these letters and you like to use different colors. So it's like, uh, you know, different colors also is about tolerance, about, um, you know, everybody involved in, in this program. So um, this is what I had in mind and I told my graphic designer what I wanted and he was, you know, pretty amazing because his first on his first attempt, he came up with this logo, which is exactly what I had in my mind. And, and we thought we'd stick with this logo because it's, uh, yes, it's, it's joyful, it's a bit childish. But we want to keep it this way because we we do that also for fun and and we like our motto says we don't take ourselves seriously even though we do serious things. That's really cool. Um, and then when you first think about when you started it and why you actually started it, was there something that made you have the idea? Was there was it your idea? Was it a friend's idea? What, what, how did it start? Um, it's a good question. Uh, when I became a journalist, I, I did this in order to make a change. Actually, I had started medical school uh, after my graduation because I wanted to be part of the foundation Doctors Without Borders. But I soon realized that, you know, 10 years of studying <laughs> would, would take uh, probably too long to be able to do something and make a change. So I'm, I switched to uh, uh, journalist school. Uh, and because I was involved as a volunteer with uh, Amnesty International, I thought that through my reports on human rights violations, I could make a change as well. So I did this for a few years uh, before I got involved with badminton. But even though I started reporting on the you know, on the competition, on something that had nothing to do with human rights, I still had in the back of my head. And I knew that at one point I would get back to uh, doing something for others. And, you know, I found that Solibad would be a, a good way to do this. And, and, you know, to make a change through my passion and to be as efficient as I could, I could use badminton and all my contacts and all my top players, friends to help. So that's, uh, um, I think that was a good, uh, a good way to do it. So just a bit of background for our audience, Raphael. I mean, how, how long did you spend in medical school before you jumped into journalism? Uh, two years. And that was enough to realize that I was not made to go for long studies. <laughs> it was uh, both hard and not so interesting. And uh, even though I still love everything that has to do with a uh, with medical uh, background, and and my dad is a doctor, so I'm you know I, I still like everything that has to do with uh, medicine. But it's ten years uh, is just too long. And I think I talked to a couple of uh, people who were uh, doctors without borders, and they all told me to just drop my studies if I wanted to make a change. It's, uh, they would say, <laughs> I would rather be a, a nurse or a first ed worker. That was, you know, it would be way more efficient than being a doctor and being in the middle of uh, the desert with uh, no means and uh, a lot of frustration. So, you know, I listened to them and I, uh, I swapped for a uh, journalist. Great, so what's Solabad since the Haiti project, what's Solabad been doing since then? Um, well, we have uh, had a, a lot of uh, programs. Um, some of them are short-term uh, programs, like uh, we couldn't help um, someone getting a house in Uganda, for instance, because we know that uh, that person with her family will be able to help others. Uh, but also we've had programs on the long run, like in Brazil and uh, in Indonesia, which are what we call our badminton programs. Um if you want to go into details, for both of them, it's uh, basically we try to uh, build uh, badminton academies in places where the children have uh, either very poor background environment or violent environment. 
and uh, then we use the badminton lessons and the uh, the sessions for them to first of all forget about their conditions and their environments, but also maybe in the future being able to make a little bit of money uh, because of, of badminton and then help their family to live this environment. And I know because we were we met at the World Championships in Basel just a couple of months ago and we had the solid bad picnic and I was lucky enough to go to that. And Igor from Brazil was there. So that was pretty special because you were telling me the story about him. Could you share with the audience a bit about one of the – a very good badminton player from Brazil, number one in Brazil at the moment, I believe, and his story with yes in relation to Solibad? Well, Igor Coelho uh, is the, the top player from Brazil, uh, but actually his story is, is a bit similar to what we tried to do in Gravata in our program, but he's done something a bit similar with uh, uh, his own uh, Mirages uh, Foundation, but his story is amazing. He's also from the township, the, the favela, where you know the kids have uh, very little, live in poor condition, and uh, his dad was at the head of the Mirages Foundation, and uh, he was a badminton coach, and he used samba as a way to uh, interest all the kids to play badminton. So they train while dancing samba, and it it was a oh, hit. Wow. All the kids joined the program, and then you know one thing led to another and he became quite good and then he was national champion and then he played in the Olymp- in the olympics in rio uh, in front of his home crowd so it was a huge success and for us having this story is a good way to show the kids in uh, gravata where our program is in uh, northeast of of brazil that dreams can come true if you believe in it and if you you know if you try hard then there is a way to leave your background and the, all the violence that they have in Brazil. And, and there is a way to make things happen. You just need to work hard and, and believe in yourself. It's a really powerful way of inspiring children there, Raphael. I just want to rewind for a little bit and just ask you briefly, I mean, what does playing badminton and dancing samba look like? Uh, <laughs> it's, what fun. It's, it's quite fun when you look at the, at the videos, uh, but it's... Just a way of uh, warming up first, and then the way they do footwork, and they they do all the exercises with their music. But it's uh, it's actually very clever because uh, there is a lot of rhythm in samba. There's a lot of rhythm in in badminton, and when you see it happening, you realize that there's a lot of things that are in common. And of course, some kids, you know, would probably find it boring to go to a badminton training session and, and do all the footwork and do this without hitting the shuttle. But when you do it with music and with a choreography, then all of a sudden it, it becomes fun. So I think it's a very good way to, uh, to make kids like the practice sessions. Is it kind of like that <laughs> the viral video that went around about the Chinese lady doing her warm up? Did you see that? Yes, <laughs> I saw it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, maybe a little bit something like that, yeah. But but what's very striking for the the example in uh, in Brazil is that when you see the videos, it's like hundreds of kids in the gym that all do the same choreography, and and you, when you see the smile on their faces, it's really really a lot different from the faces of the kids we see in the Western world that do their footwork and they are obviously very bored by it because there's no shuttle involved and and no fun. It's just they have to do it because they have to know the footwork. But when they dance, then, you know, it becomes a lot more fun, just like that Chinese lady. And that's a very funny video indeed. (laughs) So other than that, what are the current projects that you have at the moment? Well, Brazil and Indonesia are the, the, the biggest ones. The one in Indonesia, it's uh, growing uh, bigger and bigger because uh, it started first in the outskirts of Jakarta on a big um, uh, garbage dump. And uh, some of the families actually live on the, on the garbage dump. And so we found uh, through the foundation of an uh, extraordinary lady who started the program and we're just helping her. But uh, she found a small badminton court near the garbage dump. And then the, the children would go from time to time to play badminton, you know, once or twice a week. And then, they, of course, in Indonesia, badminton is like the number one sport. So they all loved it. And then they went more and more. And then we figured that maybe we could build a team out of the best kids from this uh, this village and then 
we did the same thing uh, for about 10 different uh, little villages all around Indonesia. And out of these 10 villages, we took the best players and we created what we call the ultimate team. And now they're all uh, together in Jakarta, another city, and they're training full-time with a pro uh, coach. And they're involved with the, with the national uh, ranking system in Indonesia, and they are becoming pros. So from their little background in the garbage dump or their poor little village in the middle of nowhere in Indonesia, they're suddenly playing with the best players in, in Indonesia. So it's a... It's, it's really a program that I love because it shows that with a little mean and little help from a coach or a little attention, then the life of a kid can change from, you know, from everything. It's uh, from being someone who picks up the garbage to have their family now. You know, they, they tour Indonesia and they play for a club and, and it's, a, it's a great reward for us to see this. So how old are these children and are they people that we know now or would, would we be familiar with their names? Not yet, but uh, some of them are still quite young, 14, 15 years old. We have a couple of uh, 20 years old who are now involved with the national tour. And uh, Novia, who is what we call the, the biggest sister and she's helping with all the younger kids. She's uh, ranked in the top 15 in Indonesia, which is you know amazing for her because she's only been playing uh, basically in a small badminton court until now. And, and the fact that she's being able to compete with the best players in Indonesia is a, is, is a great reward for her and for the program. And, and, and it shows that, you know, like Igor in Brazil, you can make, um, you know, you, you can follow your dream and make something happen if you really believe into it. And Raphael, out of all of the projects you've done, all the places you've traveled for Solibad, what would be the most enjoyable or the funniest or the most fun experience for you? Uh, it's difficult to, to say. I think my trip in Nepal was one that I will uh, keep a, a great memory of. Uh, we, we helped uh, some kids in their school through, through clubs. The, the clubs are sponsoring the children for their um, uniforms and their daily school supplies. So, going to Nepal and interacting with these young kids in also very poor environment was, uh, was very, very interesting. And it was fun because even though they're very poor, they're always smiling and always uh, eager to play because of course we brought some rackets and, and, and shuttles and played with them. So that was really uh, uh, a great time I had in, uh, in Nepal. It was uh, two years ago. But of course, there's, there's many, many places where I love to go in Uganda when uh, we have a program where we help the widows and uh, their children stroke with the AIDS. And, and of course, there's no water, there's no electricity, and it's uh, very rural. But we came there with the badminton rackets and with shuttlecocks and the whole village was playing, you know, from... Uh, when the sun was rising until the sun was down because there's no electricity, there would always, always be someone on the badminton court. And that was also a, a lot of fun. Yeah, it's, look, it's, it's probably a little unfair for us to tell you to pick which one's your, your favourite out of all these different stories that so far you've told us that are all very incredible and, and all sound very um, fulfilling. It, it, but if we were to take the opposite direction and say... What what's the biggest frustration or failures that you've had with Solabad that you can that you have learned from? Uh, of course, when you're involved in the charity work, there's there's always a lot of uh, frustration when we realize that we lack funding to help children, or when we have to make a decision on which kids can go in the program instead of another, uh, because we simply don't have enough money, or when. You know, when you've done all you could to help a, a kid to get out of uh, the violence and the drugs and the, and the environment, and then you, you think you've managed to do so, and then you hear a few weeks later or a few months that he's been killed by a mob or, or died using drugs because he went back to this environment, then, of course, you know, it's, it's heartbreaking and, and you feel like it's not fair, but that's life and, and we need to face it and continue for all the others who succeed. There's no, no choice. We, we need to be positive always, even though there are stories, stories that are very, very sad. Yeah, that sounds incredibly challenging to have to face and then to continue moving forwards with the project. But I'm glad that 
you know, you, you've done so much great work and that you continue to as well. Raphael, I can see when I go to the, the tournaments, the world's best tournaments and things like that, there are a lot of players that have the solid bad symbol or the, the logo on their T-shirts and on their clothing. What does that represent? Who are they? And I know that they're ambassadors. What do they represent and what do they do for Solabad? Well, a lot of them are involved uh, in different ways. Some are very, very involved. And every time I run into them in a tournament, they ask me what they can do and uh, uh, if they can do more than what they already do. Of course, wearing our logo is great because it's, it's an amazing promotion. You know, being on TV with all these millions of viewers, it's, it's fantastic for us. Um, a lot of them uh, would give us some rackets or some T-shirts for auction. And uh, there are about 10 of them, some of them top stars, who uh, pledge to give 1% of their uh, prize money. So that means that every year they give 1% of what they earn in the year, which is, you know, for some of them it's quite substantial and, and it really helps. So um, it, it all depends on the ambassadors. Some are official ambassadors and they're not as much involved as others. But uh, there are some who are amazing and fantastic and, and, and really make a difference. Yeah, that's really cool um, because I always see it. And I'm sure there's a lot of listeners out there that have seen the symbol or the logo on people's T-shirts and clothing, but don't actually know what Solabad means, what it represents and what you do. So I really hope that those people are listening to this episode so that they can understand what they're doing. So if I'm, for example, if I'm not a top player and I don't have the TV time or the screens on me to show the Solabad symbol, but I really resonate with Solabad's reason for existing, your mission, what you're doing, how you're helping bringing smiles onto children's faces and promoting the sport in areas that potentially aren't as fortunate or don't have the opportunity to play as much as we do, what can someone do to help to support Solabad's cause? Well, there's many ways to help. Uh, of course, um, donation is the, the easiest. And, and of course, it's not only all about money, but it's certainly help our programs because we have to fund and, and you know, funding goes through receiving donations for, from people. But, um, you know, you can either donate online, but you can also buy the goodies that we have on our online boutique. And, and you know, it's Christmas is coming soon, so it's uh, if you have badminton friends, it's a good way to buy some laces or uh, some badminton-related items, uh, which are very colorful and and quite nice. Uh, but also, if you're a member of a club, uh, clubs can join uh, Solibad and sign what we have, what we call the Solibad Charter, and that means that they can talk about our programs to the kids in the clubs and then uh, maybe organize fundraising events and and do things like that, which is uh, quite nice in the club because it also brings people together. Um, you know, when you organize a fundraising event, all of a sudden you have people, not only the people who play on a regular basis, but also family members, grandmothers making cakes and everything. And that what we've seen in France from experience, it's uh, clubs who, are, who have signed a charter and who do um, fundraising events on a regular basis. They are like a very, very um, friendly clubs and uh, it, it really brings something into the clubs to, to have something done outside just badminton playing. So that's something that, that the clubs can do. So if you are a member, you can talk to your friends and, and try to, to join the Solibat Charter. Um, but also anybody is welcome to help. You know, there's a platform for volunteers uh, online. You can uh, just give your name and uh, the time that you have and then I'm sure that uh, you can help uh, maybe talking to clubs, contacting events uh, if they want to help by doing fundraising or, or, or things like that. So there is a way to help at every step. Uh, anybody can help, really, if, if, if they have a, the will and the time to do so. And so if I was one of these listeners who are looking to support Solabad's cause, I mean, how can I get in touch with you or with the Solabad organization? Well, you can go online. We have a website called, uh, it's uh, solibad.net. And, um, you know, all the information about our programs are there, but also on how to join as a volunteer and how to help. And, of course, the, the contacts, uh, my email is there, so you can uh, get in touch directly with me through the Solibad's contact page. So, Raphael, 
Is there anything that you want to share with our audience about Solabad that we haven't already talked about today? Um, well, maybe just the fact that uh, we mostly are a bunch of friends and, and people passionate about the sport, but also feel like we can make a difference while having fun. And that's that's one of the strong messages that we send out when we talk about Solibad is uh, we're doing charity work, of course, but we're having fun and we're doing everything we can to make a difference in these kids' lives, but we're doing it in the way that uh, it's not uh, painful or it's not, uh, it's just, you know, we try our best and we can only do so much, but we do it with uh, always a positive mind. And and I think anybody who wants to join Solibad should be in the same uh, state of mind. And, and you know, there there will be always frustration for not being able to do so much or, or more, but uh, we take it as already you know, um, a good thing to be able to do a little something. And whenever we work together as a, you know, either as an ambassador or as a volunteer or anybody helping Solibad, that's the state of mind that we want to be into. So it's really, uh, it's a great adventure to be, uh, to be on board with. And, and all the people that have been involved with Solibad, you know, are really having fun doing it. So it's, uh, you know, I'm, I hope that many people would uh, hear this podcast and, and thank you for having me in the program. Uh, but uh, it's it's really all about having fun and making a difference at the same time. Yeah, and I hope everyone listening can really feel how Raphael is just so genuine about what the program means to him, what Solabad means to the badminton community and what's, what it's bringing to the sport because I really do and I hope that people do get in contact with you to help, to support in some way, even if it's just by buying some goodies or actually volunteering a little bit of time to, if you've got the bad, badminton background, to actually go out and help the kids and be part of the program because I'm sure Raphael would love to have you helping and building the program in itself. So Raphael, thanks so much for being on the podcast. It was really nice to have you on and I hope you were able to talk about what you were really passionate about and what you wanted everyone to know about. Well, thank you for having me and uh, good luck with the, the program. Its name is you know, the, the French background, so it should work, right? <laughs> you can say our, uh, our name better than we can, actually. How, how would you say it as a, as a Frenchman? Volant. 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 You heard it here, Volant. guys. Volant. <laughs> <laughs> and do you, call, do you call the shuttlecock Volant? Yes, the, that's the official name yeah. for the shuttlecock. It's a Volant. It's a Volant. Fantastic. So, like I said, thanks so much for being on. There were so many really important parts from this podcast that I took away. The first thing for me was just really understanding about Solabad and what what you do because I always see the logo everywhere. And it's really interesting to me about your story. So your story from being a medical student and deciding not to do that, then you've changed and you've gone into journalism, into not essentially badminton, but then you started playing, you love badminton and you've kind of made this really cool career that's went from journalism to bad zine. You've got bad zine happening and then you've got badminton photo because you saw a space for photography in badminton and then now you've got solo bad and you've got so many things through badminton. And what I really learned about what you've spoken about today, Raphael, is that you don't have to be a player or a coach or an umpire to have a career or have a future in badminton. You don't have to do the world's best. There's so many ways you can enjoy, contribute to the sport, meet the world's best, be great friends with them like you are and really give back and do something that really means something to you. So that that was really cool for me. All right. Well, thank you so much for your praise. It's uh, it's great to hear. And Raphael, for me, what I took out of this conversation is that your, your, your life has kind of been a big game of choose your adventure. And, and it certainly seems like that you could have really gone down some very different pathways. And who knows where you might have ended up if you had become a medical doctor or a, a professional tennis player or, or gone down the same pathway in tennis and we ended up with tennis zine instead. But what I've really liked about this podcast is that you talked about being grateful and and traveling the world and being open to new experiences and new perspectives. And the key, I guess, I would take away from this is that you can make a difference regardless of what monetary backing resources that you might have, whether you are, like Jeff said, a badminton player, a fan, um, not even a badminton player, you can still make a difference. And, you know, it, it doesn't take 
a lot to make someone smile and I'm really glad that you are able to do that with Solar Band and I hope that you can continue to do that uh, in, in the future as well. Well, thank you so much. We'll certainly try to. So for everyone listening, thanks so much for tuning into the Badminton Podcast by Volant Wear, the world's most versatile badminton apparel. We're going to continue to invite guests like Raphael to tell their really interesting stories and they can share their experiences so that you can learn from them, you can be entertained by them, and you can hear some really interesting stories that might just may as well inspire you to do different or great things with your life in badminton or out. Make sure you keep sharing your love for the sport with everyone that you know because it really is a great sport and we want to show the world how incredible badminton is. And you can do that through your local clubs, you can do that in your state, nationally, and you can also do it internationally as well through programs like Solabad who really do make a real big difference to us. If you do want to get in contact with us though, you can easily contact us on our social media, so Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube via our handle Volantware, V-O-L-A-N-T-W-E-A-R, or on our website, www.volantware.com. And Raphael, I think I said it right. Volantware. Yes, correct. Com. Very good. <laughs> Bye. 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 <laughs> this podcast was brought to you by Volantware, the most versatile badminton apparel you'll ever own.